Welcome everyone, sorry we're a bit late. I hope you can all hear me. We are very privileged and excited as MSC to have all of you on this webinar uh, joining us from wherever you are. Good morning and good afternoon. Today, we are here to have a conversation uh, with industry experts on what it takes to make credit accessible, convenient, and affordable for women. And the focus is with those traders who are open, operating in open air markets, as well as across borders. The agenda for our conversation today is I will start off with a brief introduction, um, which is what I've just done. And then I will invite um, Amani Mbale, the Senior Program Officer at the Gates Foundation, to give her keynote address. Unfortunately, she was traveling back uh, to the US and so wasn't able to join us, uh, but she sent a recording, so I'll play that in a short while. Thereafter, I will get into results of a qualitative survey that MSC undertook with a few financial sector experts. That will run us uh, up to 25 minutes past the hour, at which point I will hand it over to our regional head, uh, Mr. Anup Singh, to have a panel conversation with a very interesting, lively, engaged, and passionate set of panelists. Um, and I'm looking forward to that conversation. That will take us up to 10 minutes past 6 EAT, at which point I will hand it over to my colleague Mandira to walk us through a Q&A session um, that will be facilitated from questions from uh, either from participants or um, from the general audience. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat as we go and we'll address those during that slot. And then lastly, we will have uh, Mr. Anup Singh give us his closing remarks. So without much ado, uh, let me ask that as we proceed, if you would kindly keep your uh, microphones muted so that it doesn't cause any disruption. If you have any questions, please put those on the chat and we will address them as we go along. Otherwise, once again, thank you, welcome, feel free, and looking forward to a lively discussion. So let me go right ahead and play a video. Uh, by Ms. Amani Mbale, the Senior Program Officer for Gates Foundation in East Africa. Regarding the opportunity. For women, um, MSME entrepreneurs um, to be able to really contribute to their, not only their own households, in their communities, but also to national growth. Um, it is my belief that it is actually a range of financial services that supports um, women in the real economy. So I'm talking about savings, I'm talking about payments, uh, remittances obviously is a form of payments, insurance, and productive credit. Um, women in business have life cycles, right? Business life cycles. And different products make sense and are relevant at different parts of the business life cycle. And initially, uh, savings is gonna be very important. And over time, as a woman gains acumen and skill in her business and her enterprise, then um, other types of financial services become uh, important as well and play their role. Insurance plays a role in protecting her against risk, and credit plays a role uh, potentially in helping her expand her business. But that's a spe very special role. I want us to not over-index on credit, but understand it is one of the options that we have um, as financial service providers, that is, to um, make women's economic uh, empowerment a reality. Uh, FSPs, yes, are grappling um, how to uh, support and finance small-scale women. And, I, and like I said, I think uh, we, it's very important that we have a range of financial services. In regards to the foundation, we see that women's enterprise and their ability to um, participate, again, in their household economies as well as their community econ economy is going to be key in order for us to support them to uh, recover from the economic shocks of COVID initially. Um, we know there's a lot of inflation, there's a lot of pri uh, prices obviously are going up and that's what inflation is. And so it's really important at this time, especially at this time, 
that we deliver affordable, accessible, and uh, convenient um, financial services um, uh, to this group. And again, a diversity of financial services. How does the foundation get involved? We get involved by working with our partners, such as FSD Kenya, but there are others. Um, we have established partnerships with Mercy Corps, AgriFin, Digital Farmer. We have uh, partnerships, obviously, in other countries uh, beyond Kenya's borders. Um, and what we're looking for is to really push the needle and say, how can financial services, again, range of financial services, really advance women's standing uh, and, their, and their access to opportunity, access to market opportunities. This is gonna be really important. And uh, we do that by, off, by listening to women entrepreneurs, by responding to their needs, by making it affordable. And when we listen and we design in consequence of what we hear, and we're continuously um, adapting um, perhaps our, the way in which uh, products are positioned in the market, their pricing, uh, where they're available, the features that they offer, then we um, unlock, uh, we help women unlock opportunities for themselves. And so that's what the foundation seeks to do with um, fintechs, with banks, with um, aggregators, and we, uh, with value chain actors, et cetera. Thank you, Mani. So I, I just thought I'd come off camera just to say hi to everyone and welcome you in. So that was an address, our keynote address by Mani Bale. Um, and, you know, very powerful words. I will not try and dilute any of what she has just said, but really, really um, powerful insights on the opportunities that the foundation is seeing, the need to think about the holistic needs of women and the opportunity presented uh, through financial services. So I'm going to now switch back on my screen share and then walk you through the results of a qualitative survey that we did. Uh, so that you get a sense of what the, con the context for the next part of the conversation is going to be about. Fantastic. So, like I said, uh, what we did is we conducted. So, as we, this is the second part of an event that we have been uh, brewing and thinking about as a team. And this was motivated by an event that we had on November, I'm sorry, on the 29th of August where we invited cross-border cross traders, open air market traders to tell us some of the lived realities of accessing credit. And some of the things that they told us were that there is a premium when it comes to convenience and there's a premium when it comes to accessibility. So it goes like this, um, the, the credit solutions that they have access to um, are, are not convenient. And then those that are convenient are not affordable. So we have this challenge of affordability influencing convenience, influencing accessibility, and we really wanted to unpack what that, what that could be about. And so what we did is we extended an invitation to financial service providers to hear from them on what are the opportunities um, to address affordability, accessibility, and convenience, as well as whether or not this hypothesis that uh, that convenience and accessibility are being offered at a premium, whether that holds true. And so what we did is we invited 100 participants uh, across the supply side and, and financial sector intermediaries, uh, of whom 30 experts responded and gave us their insights, and those I will walk us through now. So as a way of prefixing the conversation, we, we, we consider convenience, accessibility, and affordability as key pillars, uh, just so that we're all on the same page. Convenience has to do with the ease to which borrowers can access loans. Um, and what we find is, um, in women SMEs, for example, site convenience is one of the main factors when they're thinking about which financial services are they going to pick and then how they'll access those. Um, on accessibility, the focus is on trying to reduce complexity. So if there's a scenario where women uh, cross-border and open-air market traders are struggling uh, to provide uh, the required documentation to access the loans, then it's very likely that they won't uh, actually go after credit and the liquidity takes a hit. 
as well, you know, affordability is about the interest that is charged to the borrowers. And so what we've seen is the average, the highest average interest rate that was being charged on SMEs at the time when we conducted the assessment with the traders was about 17%. And at that rate, uh, a number of SMEs told us that, hey, this is super expensive. We can't quite use uh, these, these solutions to access credit in a sustainable way and grow our business long term. So this next slide is addressing the, the hypothesis that we went in with. So like I said, um, the participants told us that there is a premium being charged for convenience. Uh, and there's a premium being charged for accessibility. So when we asked the participants among the financial sector intermediaries, uh, about 45% disagreed with this statement. So they actually said, no, there is no premium being charged for convenience. Um, and as well, when we asked the same, same experts around, is there a premium that is being charged for accessibility? Um, we were at a deadlock. So half, about half of the participants on either side said there was or there wasn't a premium being charged for accessibility. So hopefully the panelists today will help us uh, untangle uh, this conundrum. In my next slide, I'll talk about each of those pillars in turn and look at what the experts told us they feel are the greatest opportunities or the greatest challenges uh, to address those pillars. So now if we focus on accessibility, there's a bit of a tie but most of the respondents told us that if we really want to address accessibility, our best bets are on designing uh, new or tailoring existing products, and then also digitizing pro uh, processes related to credit uh, administration, uh, application and disbursement. So that's how we make credit more accessible. And the challenges related to uh, driving accessibility of credit is the cost. The providers felt that um, actually designing new products or tailoring existing ones or training teams is, is a significant cost that they have to incur and that ends up being a barrier to Im uh, improving accessibility. Now we think about convenience. Uh, on convenience, the, we ask experts the same, same question and overwhelmingly most of them told us that digitization is the way to go if you want to make this, if you want to make credit more convenient, uh, digitize. Interestingly, a, high, a fairly high number of people talked about building business relationships, um, which, which, which I thought was pretty interesting, but the overwhelming uh, majority are focusing on digitization. Um, in terms of the, con uh, the challenges that are making it difficult for credit to be convenient to this segment, the main drivers for the main challenges on this side were the costs, again, like we've seen before. Uh, so the costs related to digitization, but then also resistance uh, that they're meeting uh, when it comes to trying to actually digitize. And then lastly, we thought about affordability. And so this is how do we make uh, the interest, the, how do we lower the costs uh, or even interest rates um, to make the, the solutions more affordable to the segment. And among the opportunities that the experts cited was uh, one uh, one strong one was the ability or the opportunity to find cheaper sources of wholesale credit so that then the end user interest rate is low. But then also the idea of analyzing customer third party and repayment data uh, to predict lo uh, loan repayment. So essentially, if we can make it easier for financial service providers to assess the credit worthiness of borrowers, then that should drive down uh, the cost of credit. On the challenges, um, overwhelmingly, what we heard was, you know, it's difficult uh, for uh, financial service providers to access cheap sources of wholesale credit, and so it makes it harder to cascade down the benefits to end users. So at this point, I would like to introduce um, our regional head at MSC, Mr. Anup Singh, who in turn will introduce the panelists and we will have an opportunity to hear from the panelists what uh, their take is on the issues that we just highlighted now. Over to you, Anup. Thank you so much, uh, Kim. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining. My name is Anup Singh. I'm the regional head for Microsoft Consulting based in Nairobi. 
Uh, I have a stellar panel, uh, stellar lineup of panelists for today's conversation. Let me introduce them to you quickly. As I introduce, I'll request uh, panelists to please switch on their cameras uh, and say hello to everyone. So I'll start first with Elizabeth Vasuna. Uh, I see she has dropped off. Uh, maybe I'll start with Rose Moturi. So Rose Moturi is the Managing Director East Africa for Branch International. She has over 15 years of experience in the financial services industry. She has worked across commercial retail banks and fintechs. Beyond this, she was the founder and chairperson of the Digital Lenders Association of Kenya. She has a broad uh, sectoral experience and she is going to strengthen the insights shared by the panelists given the critical role digital service providers play in providing credit to women entrepreneurs. Welcome, Rose. Thank you. I will set up my video as soon as I get access. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so then uh, my it's my pleasure to, I see Elizabeth has joined. So Elizabeth Vasuna is the business banking director for APSA in Kenya. She has over 25 years of banking experience in Kenya. She leads APSA's uh, strategy in driving business banking and overseeing the innovative She Banking program. Uh, we believe that her hands-on experience will strengthen the panel discussion, specifically on what role can commercial banks play in incubating and growing women-led businesses. Welcome, Elizabeth. And thank you very much. And good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everybody on the call. I'm really looking forward to this uh, awesome conversation. I know I'm struggling with putting on my camera, but I'm sure it will come on in a short while. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Then we have Phil. Liz Kariuki, she is a financial inclusion specialist at the World Food Program in Kenya. She has over 18 years of financial inclusion experience, and she has worked with notable NGOs uh, such as Care and Energy for Impact and the World Council of Credit Unions. So we believe that her broad expertise will enrich the discussion on how uh, different types of financial institutions can work together to address the credit needs of women entrepreneurs. Phyllis, most welcome to our panel. Thank you and good evening, good morning and good afternoon. I believe my camera is on yes, and yes. looking forward to have a healthy discussion. Thank you. Welcome, Phyllis. Then lastly, we have Charles Kiyoko. Charles is the CEO of uh, Gitunguri Dairy Sako. He has over 30 years of experience, having worked across several leading institutions in financial and non-financial sectors. The reason we thought we should have Charles on this is to also have a voice for the Sako, which is quite considerable in terms of size uh, in, in the Kenyan financial ecosystem. Charles, welcome. Thank you so much. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, participants. I'm looking forward for a very healthy discussion on this matter. Asante. Welcome. Okay, great. So, Nick, uh, we had a conversation and, and we started talking uh, in detail about the accessibility, convenience, and affordability aspect. Together with this panel, uh, we would be discussing accessibility, convenience, and affordability conundrum for women small scale entrepreneurs. Uh, let me read out two key insights where, which Kim did talk about. The first thing he said that the loan products which are convenient for women entrepreneurs in Kenya are not, are not affordable. And the loan products that are affordable to women entrepreneurs are not accessible. So we are seeing the convenience, affordability and accessibility conundrum over here. So I like to uh, give one minute each to my panelists starting first with uh, Rose. Uh, if we can have your thoughts on these insights. Do you think it is a real conundrum between the convenience, affordability, accessibility? Uh, thank you, Anup. And I actually was wondering whether the, it came in any particular order, the three of them, or they were just mentioned um, as top of mind, because that really is very important for us to understand. I do believe, yes, it is uh, an issue that still continues to affect, uh, uh, especially when women want to access services. Can you hear me? Can hear you. I think we lost you momentarily. Apologies for that. So, uh, so I, ideally, I, I think yes, it is a conundrum that is facing the women. I would say, uh, having dealt with the microcredit space and especially in the digital. Uh, space as well. Uh, what we've seen is the realities of um, what has been mentioned, for instance, the convenience bit. Uh, it becomes a reality because if you're looking at uh, splitting between working capital, which is urgent, uh, 
uh, versus long term, maybe someone wants to put up a structure. Uh, the working capital requires someone to be able to have the speed. So the convenience where uh, people are able to get it much quicker or the women are able to access it much quicker becomes a reality. Then also, how are they accessing it? So does it mean they have to show up somewhere and apply or can they be able to do it privately? Does everyone have to know that they were applying for a loan? And then in our experience, affordability, much as it's a reality, has always been the last uh, um, the last part of that particular conversation. It will not be the first thing they will ask. It will be, okay, fine, thank you. Now that, that I can be able to access, how much is it? So I, I do agree with the fact that the, the three are a reality. Great, Elizabeth. Thank you, very interesting. Um, you know, findings from your, your survey. And, um, you know, for me, I had, you know, I really debated about this and, you know, had a lot of conversations internally and externally to just try and see how do we balance the two. Yes, I do believe that loan products are affordable, you know, are not necessarily accessible to women because of the many barriers that they face. There's limited funding based on gender and cultural biases. We have issues around, you know, balancing responsibilities as far as women is concerned. You know, where do they put this, the funds that they, they, they access? You know, inadequate support systems that women do struggle with. Um, you know, we've seen this during the COVID period, you know, how, where do they find support in being able to run their homes and run their businesses? You know, women do lack a lot of ment mentorship and, you know, people to hold their hands to the conversations around ideation, you know, financial access, even emotional support sometimes is lacking. Um, they also have issues around limited business knowledge, which is something that we've known for a long time and, you know, working very hard to try and, you know, uplift. And favorable business environment, yes, those are things that are, you know, hinder women to be able to access, um, you know, affordable, you know, affordable loan products. But at the same time, when it comes to, you know, how do women then, um, you know, uh, get convenient, you know, affordable uh, um, facilities in, or loan products in Kenya, it's a bit debatable because you don't want to create an environment where it's imbalanced. You know, you can't have, you know, cheaper facilities for women as opposed to, you know, the men folk. So what are we then saying? The issues then, we you know, when you dig deep into it is, do women then know what the need and the use of the funds? A lot of times we find women coming into the banking premises and asking for loans when perhaps they should be asking for working capital facilities because short term you know requests should be matched with short term uh, funding not short term funding then is going towards capex or expansion facilities and therefore affordability becomes an issue we also do find that you know do women fully understand the, the issues around you know risks that you know funding comes with because you know if you don't understand that that actually contributes to the cost of the facility you know and therefore having a, a conversation with women we should be able to address those issues and then the issue of affordability will probably not be as pronounced because then you have a cash flow that speaks to the risks and you know you've, you've mitigated them all and you understand what products to ask for for the things that you require in a business so it's a bit of both but I think it's it can be addressed by having a wholesome conversation with women, both non-financial and financial. Thank you so much. Uh, very, very interesting insights. Uh, before I move to Phyllis, I see that you know some of our panelists are dropping in and out. It's raining in Nairobi with, and the electricity is playing hide and seek. So the participants who are joining us from outside, please bear with us. Phyllis. Um, I, I like what Elizabeth has just said, and I think when I look at this conversation, I'm looking at this conversation from a very interesting perspective, and that is that one of um, trying to understand the needs of women, because I think the, the center of this discussion is really touching the lives of women, and I'm looking at uh, uh, affordability, accessibility, convenience, and I'm looking at the different types of, when we talk about women, what I, what comes to my mind is what type of women are we looking at? We're looking at different types of women here. We're looking at first the urban woman, and the urban woman could be a woman over 50, and then we have a youth woman. We're looking at a rural woman, and then a rural youth woman. And then since I'm in this space of the arid counties, I'm also looking at the pastoralist uh, woman, woman who is, who is a, an SMSC. 
And then I'm also looking at a youth woman in that space. And uh, when I look at the issues that we're discussing today on um, affordability, convenience, and accessibility, I ask myself a, a number of things. Are we looking at gendered financial products that suit the various needs of the women? Are we looking at uh, even the women when, they, when we categorize them, you find that they have day-to-day -day needs, we have liquidity needs, a lot manner of needs. And then I'm also looking at the channels that are used. Are they easy, convenient to the different women groups that are mentioned? I'm looking at the registration processes, information provided, how accessible is the information? I'm also looking at the behavior, financial behavior of these women and in the different categories. And, and basically I'm looking at this from more so an NGO perspective because ban is to build capacity of women to participate in the financial markets and looking at convenience, looking at affordability and looking at accessibility and asking myself very various questions. And, um, and, and, and this discussion is very important because it touches a bit on everything, but uh, convenience for me is something that we need to deep dive through and ask ourselves some harder questions. Affordability also looks at the different needs that we're looking at. And um, we're looking at, when we talk about affordability, what comes to mind is low interest rates and vis-a-vis -vis the products that are out there. And, and then I'm also looking at uh, convenience and, uh, and asking myself, how do all these things come to play? And this is a very good starting point for addressing all this. So let's continue this discussion and, 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 and try and understand this in the perspective of the women that you're trying to address and the different needs of the different types of women groups. Thank you. I think you raised very important questions. Charles, your take on this, on the conundrum of accessibility, affordability, convenience. You are on mute, on, on mute Charles. Uh, thank you so much, Anup. I've gotten the discussion by the other panelists, but I want to come in from a global perspective mm -hmm. where I'm going to mention goal number five. Uh, goal number five talks about uh, making sure that uh, there is uh, achieving gender equality in terms of um, empowering women and girls. So this space and this qualitative survey that has been done is actually anchored on a very good global goal that emphasizes on the need to make goal number five accessibility to credit for women and girls. This is my take. I want to agree with the qualitative uh, survey findings. Sure, it is correct that uh, loan products that are convenient for women and entrepreneurs are not accessible. I want to agree with that statement and fall in the class that supports that qualitative survey feedback. This is because um, you will find that uh, when we look at the clusters of women in the urban areas, in the middle urban centers and towns and the women in the deep of the remote places, these women are playing in two different spaces, totally different terrains and have different needs. When you look at a high elite woman, in an affluent market, it is true, credit is accessible. It is true, it is convenient to apply. And it is true, it is affordable for that class of a person. But as we continue uh, enforcing goal number five, which is about empowering and uh, making sure that there's global access to credit, it now means that not every woman will be able to assess this credit. And this is the point that we keep on supporting, especially in the circles. Circles are credit-based institution, but that credit is first farmed up by a saving. And uh, the remarks by, by uh, Amal, the first remark said, when we talk about credit, most people always look about loans. It is, should it be? Finance should always talk about both savings and the credit. And you will find that most of the institutions do not provide a saving vehicle, which will now instill a discipline for people to assess credit. And you'll find that in the late 1990s and early 2000s, specifically in Kenya, there was a liberalization and this affected most of these people who were termed as unbankable, and they ended up forming circles. 
small quasi-banking outfits that would afford to them a saving vehicle and a credit vehicle. So when I see a qualitative study using a survey, qualitative survey method having done, the survey is very correct for having a high number of respondents agreeing that convenience will be there, yet accessibility is not there, based by the factors that most of the Kenyans in the early 2000s and 1990s before when the liberalization came, the unbankable population was left with no place to turn to. And that's where we find financial deepening in the space of cooperatives now. And even now going much deeper to circles as a big place to play. And uh, uh, institution and uh, intermediaries and uh, players, both global, are getting directly to work with cooperatives because of that unique and actually being able to understand the language of that down person there, who we are being able to build up testimonies. And we are able to say, well, we may not have a specific product for women. What Phyllis was, was calling gendered, gendered loans, we have not yet. But we have statistics of women taking loans and we have evidence that women are very good loan payers. But how would we make credit accessible to them? And how will we make it convenient? That discussion is what elicits interest. And the uh, MSC actually is very timely to have carried out survey. So I agree and I support and I increase the number of percentages of people and the respondents are saying that it could be convenient, but it's not accessible. Thank you, Anup. Great points. Thank you so much. And also for bringing the SACO perspective and the SDG perspective into this. Moving on to our second area. So here we start unpacking some of the aspects on accessibility uh, and then affordability and convenience. Let's talk about the accessibility aspect. So from our qualitative survey that came presented on accessibility, we learned that the greatest opportunities to address accessibility are designing new or tailoring existing products for women entrepreneurs. And then also enabling more access points uh, focusing on bringing women agents into the fore. While we did talk, talk, we do talk about the design of new or tailoring of products and more access point. The biggest challenge in addressing accessibility is cost related to designing the new product, tailoring existing ones, training teams, and expanding access points. So maybe we start first with uh, Elizabeth on how do you see these opportunities and challenges, and what is your institution doing about it? specifically focusing on the on the on the she bank uh, product that you have been working on thank you very much anup and it's a it's a real project area for us at the bank at absa bank we've taken time to try and figure out you know not necessarily pushing products to the customers and most most probably the women we've gone back to them to hear what they had to say and to Phyllis's point earlier on, you know, we have different types of women that we, we have to deal with. So you can't have one size fits all. And therefore having conversations with a great number of women um, across the country, I think the four principles that really kept on coming through um, that would support women in being able to sit at the table to have meaningful conversations around financing and then be able to then go back and do their businesses were premised on four things. And I think I've discussed them a number of times. But the four things are one, women want mentoring and coaching. It is something that we can't run away from. And if we were to design a product, we needed to have that in included in that conversation. How do you teach women, but then provide them with mentors, mentors and coaches who can support their conversations moving forward? Women also asked you know, around issues around access to markets. They do have wonderful products. They do have services, but they do need an opportunity you know, to, to be shown where the markets are. So I think aligned to the various conversations we've had, we partnered with different organizations to enable women see the opportunities to be able to market their products and services and therefore have a better view on how they can progress forward. The third pillar we had as ABSA 
is how do we get, make sure that women have access to networking? Networking is important because you're able to size yourself, see where you are, and then also see other where other women are to be able to see you know where you are and what are the steps you can you know go through to be able to grow your business. So networking, making sure that we have the right people in the room to ensure that women's businesses have the right pillars to stand on because a lot of businesses are named after ourselves. So I keep on saying, for instance, it would be called Elizabeth and Sons or Elizabeth and Daughters for that matter and that business needs to go beyond me so how do i make sure through the networking forums i make sure we have KRE, which is our kenya revenue authority in the room because compliance and governance is important for a business no matter what gender is running it and a lot of women unfortunately run away from this and then end up having issues uh, around you know KRA remittances and and it's from from lack of information and lack of knowledge that for a business to be sustainable you have to have those pillars in place and the final pillar for us has been at access to finance which we speak about so we've we've crafted proposition that speaks to unsecured facilities up to 10 million shillings for those who already bank with us and 7 million shillings for those who are starting a relationship and all we ask is that you know they have a, a series of you know banking whether it is through their circles their cooperatives you know through mpesa which is based on the kenyan domain you know, and through their statements for those who are starting. Let's see what your cash flows are. We've also crafted the, this proposition, which we call Absis She uh, Business Account for Women, that speaks to non-financial non information. So we take women through how what cash flows look like, projected cash flows, so that you can have a wholesome conversation with the women, you know, to make sure that their businesses can stand and move forward. And I think over the last two years, since we, produce, we, we launched our product, we've seen a great number of women coming in and plugging into these conversations and being much better at putting forward their propositions, taking more responsible facilities, and then coming back when they have issues because we are partners to make sure that we can support you moving forward. During COVID, you know, we were able to support a lot of women, you know, with moratoriums because we were conversing, you know, we were having conversations around the hardships we saw. So I would think, you know, having propositions for women, you must take into consideration the targets, make sure that you're providing them financial and non-financial, and speaking to the pillars that I've spoken to would really greatly uh, move women from where they are to the next level. Great, very comprehensive response. Phyllis, can, can I invite you to go next? Yes, and again, um, I'll put a caveat there that um, I'm, I'm still looking at the last mile, uh, the last mile type of women. And these are the women who are highly illiterate and um, in terms of both numeracy and literacy, and um, are maybe in the remote pockets here and there. So if you look at that woman and look at the cost of reaching that woman, you find that there's some intermediation that is required by formal financial institutions to, to, to see how they can reach that woman. And, um, and that woman is also a businesswoman, a micro businesswoman, but she's in the last mile category of, of, uh, of like entrepreneurship. Or, uh, so, so when you're looking at the needs of that woman, and looking at what instruments or channels will be used to meet the needs of this woman, we'll see indeed the costs for financial institutions are quite high. So we need to ask ourselves, what other intermediaries can we use to be able to reach this, this type of, of, of left out group? I'll, I'll call them, probably I'll call them the excluded group, and that's the target group or more, more or less the target group that NGOs try to support to try and build their capacities to put them in, to try and build their capacities to meet the requirements of formal, formal financial inclusion or formal financial service providers. So if you look at that missing lot, again, it's the questions that you've asked on related to costs of designing new products, tailoring existing ones, uh, or training teams, you find that the costs are quite high to reach that kind of woman, the last mile kind of woman, but, there are some intermediaries that we can we can say that can be put in place, like building financial literacy. Um, we can we can talk about uh, some interfaces that that can can be put in place to reach the last mile kind of woman, or the woman who is um, excluded. So when you look at uh, the costs, we are looking at uh, cost of um, training probably, and uh, if you look at some institutions have uh, through through their foundations are reaching out to such women with products targeting, lifting up these women 
to a level where that they can now participate in the formal formal spectra and and more more so trying to build the informal uh, through maybe VSLAs, table banking, self help groups, farm organizations, and once they build capacity at that point, then financial institutions can come in uh, uh, as partners and now take them over. But there's a missing link between the last male type of woman and the other type of women who are more empowered. And therefore, we need to look at how we can bridge those gaps in terms of, like you have said, in terms of costs, in terms of products, and in terms of partnerships that can we can put in place to try and see how we can bridge those gaps. Great points. Thanks. Charles, would you like to go next? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, allow me to go next and actually get to the space of uh, the cost of developing new products or modifying the existing products in the domain of making a credit convenient, accessible, and affordable for women. I want to get in, in a very optimistic and a very pos positive uh, philosophy. I want to get to this discussion of positivity not, and say that uh, whereas uh, SACOS or savings and credit institution have not yet uh, gentered their products, we have always had a one resolve that uh, this class of people are the same people who had uh, initially, when the liberalization came, been neglected by the mainstream commercial banks. And that's why they started their own outfits. My video is not able to show, and I'm sorry, I'd really have wished to have the video on. But you realize that, we realize that because this class of people met with a certain unmet needs when they were starting these savings and credit outfits, these outfits have really grown over time to a level that they are now regulated by a regulatory body. Therefore, these outfits of savings and credit or circus have been developed to make sure that they meet the needs of these people. Now, specific to women, is whereas we do not have a specific product for women, developing a specific product for women in a circle is very easy. Because first of all, these people are the shareholders. Number two, these same, same people are the customers. There is what we call dual complexity of ownership in cooperatives. And that's why plugging in into the cooperative space makes financial inclusion very easy. Now, for example, let me take the case of Gedunguri Dairy. We have 50,000 members, over 28,000 women. If we wanted to tailor make a product specific for women, it would flow very easy because we will not make the product in the boardroom. Products designed in the boardrooms will not see the tests of the ground because we'll actually go there with a product that have been copy pasted in a developed country and take it to an bankable populace and then bankable populace product may not match the needs of uh, that law farmer. At Gidengori, what we do, we have always initiated every time that we want to start a product is we go out to the farmers. We go out to that uh, open hair market trader we ask them, what would you really need? Are we making customer centric products? That is the, 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 the major thing. Because I've seen commercial banks coming up with um, products and saying these are female products, but the female who was interviewed in that question was an elite. So a product for an elite may not sustain a product for, for the last mile lady. Therefore, once we do, once we do, once we do the, 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 the visits, we are able to pick the points directly from them. There you come to the office, you do idea screening, you make a prototype of a product, you sample about 100 members, you run and see how will this product operate. Then you make a mass launch of the product and absorb it. But one thing for sure we have learned in the cooperative space that it is always very easy to plug in a new product. 
the major competitive advantage of this cooperative space is that this credit advanced to them has been built up by savings coming from their members. And there's no given time credit in cooperatives will escalate to the levels of more than 12% or 13%. And that is very accessible because if you count and you do uh, the effective interest rates, the effective cost of that credit annually, it comes to 6.5%. There is no better affordability than that. And that's why from the space where I'm seated from a practical experience, uh, this institution previously uh, termed as quasi banks are now registered as uh, cooperatives and with a specific legislation in Kenya is the best vehicle to, ch to channel any, any idea generation or any perceived uh, women inclusion subject. It will be much more effective through the circles and the cooperatives. That is my feedback, Anup, and thank you. Thank you so much. Rose, your take on this? Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I really like the product push from Charles uh, representing yeah. the <laughs> uh, And I actually like the fact that we have a different um, spectrum. So you have Elizabeth looking at, I would perceive it as a medium enterprise going up. And then here we are representing branch where we're looking at the micro segment, which I'm going to speak about in a, in a few seconds. And then we have Phyllis who's talking about the last mile. And uh, sometimes when you put all the women in one basket, some of these topics get um, entangled. So when we're looking at designing and tailoring new products or just tailoring services and products for women entrepreneurs, our take as branch, which is um, a digital bank where we, we do not wish customers to fill in any paperwork. We use the most basic of tools, which is the phone. And due to the ubiquitous nature uh, that it has, one thing we've seen is we are in agreement that yes, we do need to maybe be proactive in terms of creating or tailoring services, but and this was just uh, from, from feedback we had received because uh, we do a lot of user research as well. It's very intimidating for uh, anyone to walk into a bank, uh, especially when you're applying for a business loan because most of it is still quite manual, to walk into a bank and then uh, possibly be asked for quite a number of um, documents which you're not able to provide. And uh, we normally call it the walk of shame where the yes or no decision depends on the person probably sitting at the front. So the digitization of that process makes it less daunting to the individual. That's why uh, we actually are very specific about the fact that we will offer working capital, non-collateralized loans. And uh, here, if you're talking about the loans or if someone wants to do savings or if they want to open an account with us because now we are a microfinance bank, we'll remove the element of you have to come and see us, you have to have a conversation and so on. What we've seen this doing is, number one, it actually reduces or completely eliminates the implicit biases that lenders or financial institutions have when it comes to women, their perception of how they handle money, and who controls the wallet, for instance. So that is already eliminated. So the data that we normally collect from the individual through their consent is where we are able to provide reports into uh, the sector to inform uh, the financial sector at large that, hey, uh, based on gender, this is what people are doing. Uh, based on age, this is what they're doing. But we do not use the, the gender lens in providing any of our financial services because we believe as a human being, uh, they should be beyond that. Uh, and, and our products and services should not discriminate in one way or another. On the other hand, we also believe that uh, we don't need to reinvent uh, the wheel when it comes to innovation. All we need to ensure is, when you talk about accessibility, we have to at, at least accept, as Branch, we've accepted the fact that we are not tapping into the last mile because some of the institutional voids we may not be able to cater for. For instance, our platform exists on a smartphone and the smartphone means you need to have access to electricity, means you have to have access to data. So you'll find our customers will be within the urban and peri-urban setup. 
and um, as long as the government continues to expand these services to the far-flung uh, areas in the country, if we use the Kenya context, the more customers we can be able to reach. So we continue innovating around what already exists. And what we've seen is even as the customers come in, especially the, the women customers as they register and, and all that happens, and some of the nuances we get are my number, um, especially if you go to culturally, uh, if you go to some communities, you'll find the SIM card was registered under the man in the house, but the way they're they are using the product, the way um, they're saving or investing or using the working capital, you can clearly do, uh, use the algorithms that we have to see that it is um, a woman who's doing this and also backed up by the data uh, or the user research that we normally do. So some of the things that uh, we are constantly looking at, honestly, the cost will be high at the beginning when you're trying to digitize your solutions, when you're trying to say, hey, how can we reach people uh, uh, as far wide as we can? Um, with, uh, you know, for instance, if you want to say, let's run maybe a women-focused uh, particular project. So the technology, of course, will help you to scale much faster and will also reduce your cost of acquisition. Again, going back to the fact that uh, we are not biasing in any way. Then the other very, very important thing, if we can wear the credit side, the heart of the credit side, I think the aspect of credit information sharing becomes very, very important. So if you do not have that mechanism where this information is being shared, you find regardless of how many solutions you will roll out or innovations you'll roll out and say, hey, this is tailored towards women or this is what's going to do, being blindsided on how information is being shared in the credit space, it will still make the cost of credit to be quite high, uh, notwithstanding whatever innovations you're doing around it. And then um, also the fact that uh, I think it's been mentioned, we keep talking about training and capacity building. I I think what I, I would want to mention in that, it's it's great to have the capacity building. It's great to train uh, the women on how to use these financial products. But I dare say that they already know how to run a business, a small business, if, if you if you'll put it that way. All they need is someone to give them a, you know, stretch that hand and say, hey, come, we can start this journey with you. So where we play is to say, if we're innovating for this caliber of customers, we are extending that um, the accessibility to us is the most important. And if you go to any um, economy, let's say the developing economy worldwide, you'll find the women running the businesses when it comes to repayment of the facilities that have been given to them, they're actually better repairs. It's a proven fact. Mm -hmm. And they will get the training after. Maybe that's the time where they are registering the business to make it become bigger or they're getting into more intricate tax regimes. That's where the, the trainings where you can tell them, hey, come sit somewhere, let's explain to you, may come in handy. But right now, accessibility is the most important. And secondly, finding out how they can be able to learn in bite sizes using the tools they already have. How can you be able to give them short text messages or short videos or something where they are to understand uh, more about the financial services that those are the type of innovations that we are currently working on. Great thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll quickly shift to the aspect of convenience because I think some of it, Rose, you already started talking about. So what we found out from the survey was that the greatest opportunity to address convenience is digital processes and uh, digit, digitization of the processes that are related to application disbursement and administration. Uh, we also heard from the financial industry uh, that the challenges that they're facing is the cost that is incurred in digitizing. And then also the resistance that comes from the staff as well as the pre-digital uh, clients. So two questions over here. The first question is uh, what digital trends do you see is going to offer convenience? to women entrepreneurs? And then how do you tackle this resistance from staff? Because that is, we are seeing this in all our digital transformation work, that staff members kind of, you know, some of them think of uh, sabotaging it because it is impacting or is perceived to be impacting uh, their jobs per se. 
Rose, can we have you again on the digitization and then we move on to the rest of the panelists? <clears throat> sure, sure, thanks. So we're really happy that we don't have the second issue that's been mentioned, especially around staff, because everything in what we do is um, digitized, all the processes are digitized. So when we innovate uh, even around collateralized type of lending, it, it is going to be fully digital. The work has already begun. So on the other part, uh, in terms of the, I, I think it was regarding the cost in car, you in car when it comes to digitizing the processes. Uh, from the beginning, yes, you definitely for any institution that is planning to go through this exercise, and I think the COVID pandemic really, really accentuated the issue where you have to ensure that you are present in a in a digital perspective. You'll find that um, the initial cost, you will pay school fees, you will learn the lessons because you have to start from somewhere, you have to understand how do you provide financial services, you have to do your know your customer process in a digital uh, manner you have to be able to tap into third parties who can be able to run this uh, process together with you so now the 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 capital expenditure that you will go through can be costly but the good thing is through time or um, how you continue running a business it becomes much much easier the best part about it as well is when you calculate your unit costs, because in the end, um, the cost of acquiring that um, particular user is minimized as you go along, uh, the cost of administering that particular lo loan is uh, minimized as you go along, it will become better. But at the beginning, yes, um, it can be pricey. So it, it, you may look at instances where do you get a strategic partner who can come in and assist, either financially or whichever way to help you or to help that institution to get uh, into that uh, or to leapfrog that milestone if i can put it that way but on sabotaging processes or making it not work if it's a culture issue in my opinion i think this can actually be resolved but uh, in this day and age it's it's the it's the way that it needs to be done really thanks charles quickly on the aspect of digitization and bringing convenience thank you so much yeah true i agree that uh, digitization is the way to go we have learned uh, through the hard way during the COVID times it came and planned and uh, there's no way we can work without that however you'll find that uh, digitization is costly at start because there are required hardwares that you need to have several licenses software licenses that you need to have you need also to be very well aware of the cyber crime securities or about the virtual private networks about the space of hackers and such that is an investment in the in the in the short run we also need to have another cost for staff capacity building that is in the short run and uh, what you can do about this is to really get into the organizational culture now and bring everybody on board so that uh, employees may not resist it the moment that they see the bigger space, that it is not about technology change. It's not about uh, digitizing. It is about organizational transformation. The moment the concept of organizational strategy and organizational transformation is anchored, resistance will not be there. You bring people together, and then we let them see the bigger picture in the future, because the future is uh, IT. And not only IT, it is ICT together with communication embedded within the scope. I still feel that the fear of losing jobs, the fear of uh, technology is taking over our jobs uh, is never here or there. It is the way to go. And we have learned it in the last two years during the COVID time and is here to stay with us. Much more innovation will keep on coming. However, still, Anup, I want to agree, there are institutions that are, that are very poor organizational willingness to change it is definite sure that change is always resisted mm -hmm. and it can, it can always be accepted the moment everybody is brought on board we look for sponsors and uh, project champions who will whose positivism within the team mm -hmm. and then the same way is propagated within the whole uh, ecosystem in an institution and then that assurance 
that this technology that is coming on board is actually making the organization bigger and making much more for everybody. Whatever was too manual is now being put on a digital button. That is my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. It is very reassuring to hear from uh, Sacco that you know you are think already thinking about digitization, and it it became a necessity uh, during the COVID time. Elizabeth, quickly uh, on this topic, what is your take, spe specifically on the resistance to change aspect? Yeah, the resistance to change, like I think I agree with uh, Charles and and Rose having discussed, is the fact that you know when whatever change comes through, you have to you have to introduce it to a company with a with a positive view. Um, change is normally resisted because you don't see the end picture, and and therefore there's no reason why they should continue to to be part and parcel of it. But what we've done differently at Absa, as you know, we have gone through a great uh, change in terms of changing our brand from Absa into Barclays. We had a lot of change conversations internally, and part of the change conversations did also include you know digitizing and making things easier, faster, better, as we say. So technology has been embraced in so many ways and we've spun the tail around and it's not just a tail, it's a fact that just because we are digitizing doesn't mean you're going to lose jobs and indeed nobody lost their jobs even throughout COVID. We've retrained, we've shown them opportunities in, in being data analysts, you know, ecosystem engagements, we talked about process experts, just in an effort to show them that this is the way the business is going and you do have an opportunity to partake of this. We've also looked at, you know, customer ex, uh, journey experts, just making sure that both from a customer perspective, things become easier, faster and better, but also from an internal perspective, things also become easier, faster and better. Because if we do not digitize, the, 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 the definite part is that the company or the, or the entity will definitely lose out in terms of cost effectiveness. So, you know, having that wholesome conversation, I don't think even today we have a situation and we do we did a poll internally just to see where we were with you know, almost an anonymous poll to see where the, the participants were and by far and large most of them were saying we're comfortable with the changes as far as technology is concerned we're happy with the view in a wholesome way so i think i know time is of, of essence and if i'll pass it back on to you but i'm, I'm sure you <laughs> There's a lot that we can speak about in the, in this conversation, you know, just to confirm the fact that, you know, most companies, especially in Kenya, um, you know, a lot of things have been digitized even by the government. So there's just no other way. We have to go the technology way. It's just how you introduce that culture in a company that makes a difference. Great thoughts. Phyllis, closing on uh, on this part. Yeah, I totally agree with the three panelists that dig digitalization is the way to go. And um, and I think uh, I also want to bring again my last mile perspective on this, mm -hmm. and uh, and and more so on the demand side, eh? because we've had like from the financial institutions, and uh, we've heard about the costs and everything from the financial institutions, but allow me to to talk about um, this from uh, the demand side side, and especially in relation to the last mile. So what we are trying to do is to, is to build capacity for digitalization in the last mile. It has not been easy. And um, let me share a very interesting perspective that we're coming to see. And more so, I'll talk about the women that we're working with in the, in the digitalization space to, to, to readiness, the, to, to prepare them for financial inclusion. So what we are seeing and some of the lessons we're learning from this is that, uh, it is quite new to them, some of the women, and especially the last male type of women. And you find that the challenges that they are facing in the digitalization space is to do with the literacy and numeracy. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and I want to talk about the perspective of the arid and semi-arid areas. So what we are seeing is that um, But does not have a phone. So mm. what we are, what we are, some of the lessons we are learning from our cash transfer programs, or yeah, from our cash transfer programs, is that the agents where they're getting the money from has a list of all the SIM cards, uh, the SIM, the PIN numbers. So mm. what they do is that when once they get to the, they're taken advantage of by the agents because one literacy is an issue, 
two, safeguarding their digital, their digital data also becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that is a space that a lot needs to be put in place um, by the government of Kenya, by the different actors and players. And um, what we are seeing is that also because of lack of financial literacy, you find that um, the women that you're working with, they fulliza, they cancel the, the SIM, they take another SIM, it blocks. Mm. So we have a lot of issues to do with data protection for especially the illiterates and, and those especially who have very little financial knowledge. So that is a challenge that we are seeing in that digital space, though I feel like digital is the way to go, even as we build capacity in that area, we are also looking at channels on how to build capacity for these uh, women to be able to safeguard their, uh, the digital and navigate that, that whole digital space. So that is what I would say. Thank you so much. I'll take you to the last question, uh, last section, which is on the affordability aspect. So there we learned from the survey that access to cheaper source of wholesale credit is um, a, a big challenge in addressing the affordability. So my question to all of you and in no, no particular order, uh, what could be the ways and means where external institutions can help the, the financial institutions in Kenya? to raise cheaper sources of wholesale funding to be able to reduce the cost. Because we saw when the interest rate was capped, it, did, it, it actually was counterproductive. It did not actually help in uh, enhancing the access to enterprise finance for, uh, for the micro and small entrepreneurs. So what could be done there? Let's quickly uh, talk about this and then uh, we'll take up some very interesting questions that have come on the chat. Let me just jump in, um, Anouk, and probably just give two, two ways that we, we went through as ABSA Bank. One, we look for partners. We look for partners where we could be able to find cheaper sources of funding, and therefore we're able to then on, pass on the cost effectiveness of finding cheaper funding to uh, conversations around women and actually the SMEs in general, because we do know that you know ex expensive capital just means that we are restricted. Remember, this is money that we get from our you know shareholders, and we need to also provide them with necessary um, you know uh, f funding. I mean, um, necessary profits, so to speak, or, or dividends. So one looking for partners was one of the ways we've, we've gone through. The second one was really opening up ecosystems where we found that when, with the corporate clients that we had, we were able to understand, mitigate risks. And you know, with mit risk mitigation, the pricing then definitely comes off. So where we were able to, for instance, uh, find anchor clients who are willing to provide, you know, confirmation of payments when, you know, uh, when dealing with women or dealing with SMEs for that matter, we then find that we're able to, you know, reduce the pricing and pass that cost uh, effectiveness to the customer. So those are two ways and I probably open out to the rest of the team, the panelists also to be able to give their views, but those two have really worked for us and we continue to work with them. Thank you. Thanks. Rose, Phyllis, Charles. So I would say that Elizabeth is in a very good position because they can be able to get that type of funding. If you um, discuss funding uh, and uh, you're talking about the, the rate at which you get it and um, you know the gross amount that you'll be able to get, if you're not in the banking or let me say the banks, you you actually have a hard time raising funds, raising that um, raising that capital, whether it's debt capital and so on. So you find what we've experienced is, and I normally say people will always overestimate or underestimate maybe that what they they don't fully understand. So if you talk about the microcredit space, if you talk about uh, we are doing non collateralized loans, we are providing uh, financial services to people who we will not see, or let's say if you're focusing on women, these are individuals we are not necessarily going to where they are and getting a lot of information about them, the funders start getting cold feet and you're talking about the local market. So mm -hmm. if you're talking about commercial paper, you'll get it at a very high price because the funders come and say, we need our money back in a shorter time. We are giving it to you in upwards of say 18, 20%. If you're looking at uh, raising funds globally, you'll probably find there are some funders who are open to 
high risk. So they'll say, hey, this is a good idea. We are happy to support. It's longer term. Then you get hit with the foreign exchange uh, uh, vol volatility that you experience in, in the African markets. So you get into this catch-22 situation where no matter how much you try to raise funds and uh, maybe try to raise low cost funding so that you can be able to uh, to provide the benefit to the consumer the access to that funding is a bit limited right now um, there's something globally that is being termed the what you call the vc winter or venture capital winter so mm -hmm. lots of the funders who ordinarily would have said hey we are into financial inclusion we are happy that you're focusing on women funding we're happy to give you long-term funds have taken a step back and said, hold on, we'll do this at a later stage. So what mm -hmm. has happened is a lot of projects that were being done uh, in support of financial inclusion are taking a beating. People are putting them on hold or are saying we cannot uh, continue bringing in more customers. We will just work with the ones that we have. So these are realities that exist outside the, let's say the banking sector, because I believe the funders um, believe in the stability of especially the tier one banks and they can be able to pump money to them versus versus the rest of us so those are the challenge some of the challenges that we face in the micro space thank you charles phyllis yeah, thank you uh, let me go ahead of phyllis yeah it is true i note that uh one of the reasons why we are not able to, or most institutions are not able to get funds for wholesale lending or for on-sale lending is about creating a brand on themselves. The space for circle that I've said has always been a space that has previously been uh, ignored. But you'll realize that uh, from uh, case studies like uh, the case of Gidunguri Dairy, which is actually has been picked as one of the case studies uh, locally, we will realize that uh, these outfits are able to get what is called blended capital. Mm -hmm. And the government of Kenya has allowed uh, institution or financiers from outside the country get directly to circles now. Initially, they were supposed to get through uh, commercial banks, and then we still get uh, our funds from commercial bank. That is not the case currently. Uh, these institutions are able to get directly to us. Um, if it is a grant, they are if they come and get interested in what what uh, the, the farmers are doing they are actually channeling the funds directly to the circles without necessarily having to pass through uh, the commercial banks we are not in any competition with the commercial banks but we are competing we compete together because we use them to we have a truncation services whereby the instruments that we have can be encashed through our office digitally and the instruments could be paid but in terms of um, scouting for wholesale credit, I've realized that circles are really attracting directly funding uh, from, uh, allow me not to say that because I'm in a panel, uh, but uh, we are able to get directly support uh, from these uh, foundations and uh, some of the big uh, supporters. This has come in two forms. One, there has been uh, grants that come and there has been what is called blended capital. And that has really been able to make sure that we are even able to give our farmers an amount of money at a cost of a very competitive rates and that affords credit for them. So blended capital in my view, and actually the question of wholesale credit, wholesale credit is available for circles as long as they make their visibility out there. The funders are, are able to come, you do due diligence of the capacity of your management, the capacity of your, they look at your credit processes. And indeed, I must say that I've been a beneficiary of several of them uh, from uh, financial literacy, fully catered for, to livestock insurance, institutions actually paying and getting interested, to things like um, capacity building, that has always been there even grants. In the current sphere of uh, climate adaptation, climate adaptation concept is actually also becoming a, a global concern. And you'll find uh, some of the um, financiers that are interested with the climate uh, concept, 
I always talk it to us about um, how would we, how would you uh, use the climate adaptation to, can you show us one of the biogases that have been done by farmers that are climate adaptation? You'll find that they are able to finance a 50-50 aspect. So on the blended capital, yes, that is there and is able to come to circle as long as, as long as we are able to prove that we have directed the money. And of course, they always ask for the geo points of the exact location of the farmer. And of course, the, you know, donor funds and the grants, they have to be accounted for to the cent. That is my view. And I, I have come in with a lot of positivism saying, wholesale credit is available for the previously unbanked populace. Initially, it would get through the banks, but now it is getting directly to circles. And uh, we really appreciate the government for even having a regulator who is actually well affirmed by exactly what is happening. Any external credit, if it's coming in dollar form, they're actually aware and it's able to really deepen financial inclusion to the previously unbanked populace that have been served by these circles. Thank you, Anup. Great, thank you. Philip, let's quickly wrap up because there are some good questions. So I'd like to hand over to Mandira. Yeah, I think for me, uh, since I'm not a financial institution, I'll just mm -hmm. say two things. One, because we are dealing with the last mile, we are looking at innovation. And one of the innovations that we're trying to pilot as we speak is uh, leveraging on blockchain technology where we are, we are, we are pairing um, issuers and, uh, for and the demand and the supply side for the last mm -hmm. mile. So there's one blockchain that we have started to pilot called Community Inclusion Currencies that works with the blockchain. And hopefully when, once we finish the proof of concept, cons, concept, we hope to see how we can tap into more of the blockchain technology to reach the last mile. And then also what we are trying also to see is, or what can work also is e-commerce platforms where we also link the last mile to to all this in preparation for them to become formally to to test these instruments for them to become to 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 try and see how we can work with them to ensure that they're ready for for more inclusion so basically mm -hmm. leveraging on, on blockchain technology and e-commerce platforms so that will be additional things that we can look into so over to you thank you so much uh thank you it was great discussion there are some really good questions so i like to invite Mandira to take us through some of these questions uh, quickly, and then uh, any of you can can answer uh, these questions. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mandira Sharma. I'm an analyst at MSC. And once again, a warm welcome to everybody. I'll quickly jump into the questions. Um, the first question is, uh, apart from the accessibility and affordability, what have financial uh, service providers done to make sure that products are designed products are designed in such a way that they can improve user experience. Thank you. Uh, anybody can answer this question. Um, you know, at the bank, I, like I mentioned earlier on, how do we make sure that the products are really focused on what, you know, for instance, the women want at this point? And what we did was we went into having conversations with the women and making sure that we can be able to understand where their pain points were. So some of the pain points that have come through were first and foremost, do they have collateral, which is security? And so our facilities, like I mentioned earlier, were unsecured up to 10 million shillings. Um, and for those who are starting the journey with us, we have unsecured up to 7 million shillings. Again, unsecured for products because um, like I mentioned, there's no collateral, no security. Most of the security in Kenya, um, you know, less than 10% of the, the titles issued out in Kenya as of end of uh, last year were actually based on, you know, uh, skewed towards the men. So, you know, asking for your father to provide security, your brother or your husband for that matter, it really hinders, you know, accessibility to capital. The other thing that, you know, we had to make sure uh, that women, you know, are looking to gain is information, access to information. Access to information, especially from the banking perspective. So we've opened out our branches, we've opened out our conversations around, you know, making sure that we can go to the women as opposed to getting them to come in. Because like one of the panelists did mention, there is an issue around, you know, walking into the bank. Women don't feel necessarily comfortable because, you know, the walk of shame, as we call it, you know, is is, is something that women would shy away from. So 
meeting them at the point at which they're comfortable makes it much, much more easier. And this we've done in partnership with a lot of organizations, Kenya National Chamber of Commerce, where they are comfortable, they sit with, you know, together with other women who walk the journey and then are guided through the processes has really helped us, you know, drive our agenda around financing women. And I'm sure there's a lot more that we can discuss, but I'm, I'm cognizant of time. But those two things come out very clearly for me. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. I think uh, you're definitely, I, I think those two things make a lot of sense. And uh, if anybody else has any further comments on this question, uh, Rose, since I can see you, if you want to contribute something here. Yeah, thanks. So I think one of the things that we 100% do is the user experience department is one of the most important ones because they speak to both the customers and uh, the developers. So some of the things that we normally do you will find on our platform the way we roll out and that's the beauty of technology if there's a new feature uh, we have already asked the users what they they feel about or what they would want to experience uh, on the platform so when we roll it out we normally start with say 10 percent of the user base see how they're interacting with it then expand that to 30 percent then 50 and so on so there's no time uh, we will involve everyone in testing a particular feature. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, and we get to see the various reactions. Then another thing that we are very excited about is the gamification. So uh, because people who are using smartphones will get interested in unlocking a new level. So you find if it is savings, we excite you by you've reached this particular level, you can unlock the next um, level through adding uh, funds into your deposit account. So you make it fun because financial services have always been in the past very boring and very intimidating. Um, thank you so much, Rose. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna to move to the next question. Um, so with the mobile credit expansion we've seen in Kenya, there's been incredible sort of improvement in accessibility, which is necessarily not equal to productive credit, which is able to support uh, business growth. So what according to you is the difference between real productive credit versus accessibility convenience and affordability um charles do you want to answer take this up thank you uh thank you so much um Madira, Sharma. i've looked at the issue of the uh, digital onboarding and i'm looking at uh, the space whereby it may not be accessible to all of them when you look at some of the regions like in Northern Kenya, because we are not talking at a global, we're not talking at the elite woman. We are talking at a global perspective and looking at some regions in Kenya specifically, there are areas that are deficient of uh, internet. And you'll find that uh, uh, the digital space in most times, even though I know we have USSDs, and, uh, but most of them run on Androids and uh, that requires internet availability. That may not provide access to credit for women, wholesomely. And uh, I still believe uh, much needs to be done so that you have an almost equal playing ground of which it can't be. But the moment that we continue having a deeper penetration to credit uh, between uh, the regions that are endowed with the resources and the regions that are deficient in others, you will find that uh, credit accessibility, not only to women, but to other minority groups uh, and uh, disabled and such, becomes a space for everybody. There's a report I was trying to look at uh, from the financial assess that tries to show the disparity between credit accessibility of men and women. And I, I think the latest, the latest report came out last year, 2021, You'll find that from the year 2016, in a span of three years, the, the gap for financial access continues to get downsized. And the statistics are very clear. Like in the year 2016, the gap for financial access, that includes even the digital space, for between men and women was 8.5%. That was the, the gap between the, the male and the female accessibility, men being on the positive, in the year 2019, that 8.5 freezed in to 5.2. From 8.5 to 5.2, that's a very good uh, jump in terms of bridging in the gap uh, in access to credit. And that includes even the digital space. The latest report that shows the financial access gap downsize was given out last year. 
and it also went down from 5.5% to 4.7. And these discussions are good because the current report, the next report that will be done in the year 2024 is likely to show a 1% gap if these conversations keep on to be abandoned. So I still believe that uh, the space has not been equal, but the, the, the gap between the male and the female access to credit continues. Thank you so much uh, for uh, for that uh, answer, Charles. Thanks a lot. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to the next question. And uh, Phyllis, could you please answer this for me? Uh, so critical to the cost of access are the very high costs of sort of digitization and high transactional costs, which greatly affect the margins for both open air and cross border women tra traders. So how should we engage MNOs to lower mobile platform costs that will facilitate the delivery of these products more efficiently? Um, what I would say is that um, um, we need to have engagement more with the, the government to see how we can especially look at the digital the digitalization process and especially targeting the last mile. If you look at the last mile, and uh, I have I have always been a, a champion of of digitalization, but I'm seeing some of the effects that are coming with digitalization in terms of regulatory framework, and uh, and I'm seeing this because of my experience in the northern part of Kenya, where I'm wondering whether digitalization is causing more harm than good. So uh, I'm, I'm I'm really at a space where I'm not too sure. It can digitalization is good for the for for some parts of the country or majority parts of the country, but when you look at the spaces like the arid areas, the northern Kenya space, I'm I'm, I'm asking myself some deep questions and trying to understand how digitalization will work for them because of the cost of the mobile phone. First, we have the we have the literacy, financial literacy, and asking myself who financial institutions are not the best to do financial literacy and so that that brings us to the private sector the role of the private sector and the role of the the ngos and and if you look at uh, the role of the ngos has been more doing the back office work in terms of supporting digit financial literacy we have foundations that have come in to support financial literacy but you find you find that um, the the space for financial institutions they don't I wouldn't say that they're doing a very good job in terms of um, looking at the effects of digitalization in some parts of the country and more so when you look at connectivity you look at the cost of the 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 phone you look at the knowledge that is in place and you ask yourself um because what i'm seeing from from my work in in the northern part of kenya is that uh, a lot of um there's a lot of um the the it's like uh, the, the, there's something that we need to do in terms of regulating um we find that the village the agents the the the, the mnos i mean the agents for safaricom for the service providers have all the same the same the same numbers they have all the pin numbers and i'm asking myself some hard questions and asking whether this is really whether we're doing more damage than good those are the hard questions that i'm asking myself and probably i don't have answers at the moment but i think that's a space we need to look at in terms of regulation and working towards um and and, and working towards consumer protection in the digitalization space and uh and how then in the digitalization space do we look at issues to do with redress and complaint handling mechanisms those are some of the things that i really don't have answers to but i think we should need that, that need to be looked into uh, thank you phyllis i think we all understand that conundrum and uh, you have answered it perfectly nobody could have answered it better i think thank you so much again and thank you everybody for engaging with us i'm just quickly going to pass it over to kim to just end the se today's session. Thanks for thanks a lot. Thank you, Mandira, and thank you all. Um, it has been an amazing, amazing conversation that wouldn't have been possible without each and every one of you coming, sharing your thoughts, sharing your questions, participating as you have done.
Thank you, thank you uh, very much. Uh, to my esteemed panelists, uh, thank you for all your insights and wisdom and time that you have shared. Thank you as well for braving the rain to be here um, and also switching on your cameras and, as, as that managed to work. It's good to see all of you. I could hear you smiling and, and responding emphatically. So it was great to see you all uh, in picture. Um, to my colleagues at MSE, thank you for the support. Thank you for um, joining. Thank you for helping us put this webinar together. It wouldn't have been the same without all of you. And at this point, we're happy to call the webinar to an end. Thank you so much for your time again. Uh, travel safe um, to your respective places of work or, or home. Uh, be blessed, uh, be well, uh, stay safe, uh, stay warm and dry. And till the next time we chat or meet on this webinar on another platform, have yourselves a lovely day, evening, uh, as the case may be. Mm -hmm.